Good morning, everyone. We are going to, to start the, the opening of this competition. Eduardo Vendrey, director of the Escola Técnica Superior de Ingeniería Informática, has the word. Thank you very much. Dar Vice Rector for Development and Information Technologies, their students, their competitors, dear colleagues. It is a big pleasure for me as the Dean to give you a warm welcome, warm welcome, to this school, the Escola Técnica Superior de Ingeniería Informática, hosting the Southwestern European Regional Programming Contest 2012. It's a great honor for us. It's a fact that becomes reality after speaking a lot about it for a long time. When John, the teacher in charge for organizing the contest, who has been promoting the participation of our students in past editions, came to us and proposed hosting this event, the school didn't adapt it and decided to give you all our support. The contest is a big opportunity for our students to take part into a bigger worldwide event, the ACM International Collegiate Programming Contest, a large and prestigious contest participating students from, a school, from a schools in all continents. For the case of this regional contest, I would like to recognize to all teams coming from Portugal, France, Switzerland, Israel, Italy, and Spain, of course. Being here this weekend means that you have been working, programming, very hard, and that you have sky skills in this topic. For your teachers and the schools, it represents the recognition for a very well done teaching activity. Congratulations. I know very well that our rectorate is also giving support to the contest. Our vice rector, as a professor from this school, is fully involved in, with ICT and therefore committed in this contest. Thanks a lot. I would like to thank also all teachers participating in the contest, helping John and the rest of the organizing team. Also the personnel from our school that has been giving support to the contest and this during this weekend helping the organization in order that everything is okay. I wish you a very fruitful weekend. Enjoy our university, enjoy our school, and if you have time and the opportunity, please enjoy Valencia. Welcome again and good luck with the contest. Thank you. Thanks, Eduardo. Now, uh, Juan Carlos Casamayor, director of the, Depart of the Department of Systems Informatics y Computación, <coughs> has the wall. Thanks, Vicente. It will be very brief. First of all, I would like to welcome all the participants to this uh, event to Valencia, to our university, to our school, and also to our department. Our department is very proud of supporting this event, which is one of the main competitions in programming at the university level. I hope that our facilities allow the development of the competition normally. I also hope that our organization team and our technical team will the whole event takes place without any problem. I'm sure that they will put all their effort into it. I take this opportunity to thank all of them for their work and dedication to the organization of this contest. Nothing more. One again, welcome to everybody. Good luck for all you and may the best team win. Thanks, Juan Carlos. Now, uh, Jonander Gomez, chair of, of this competition, has the word. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the ACM ACPC 2012 Southwestern European Regional Contest. Welcome to Valencia and welcome to the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia. First of all, please, let me thank to Mr. Vicente Botti, the Vice Rector for the Development of Information and Communication Technologies of the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia. <laughs> oh. No. Now I am relaxed. <laughs> okay. 
Also, thanks to Mr. Eduardo Vendrell, Head of the School of Engineering in Computer Science, and to Mr. Juan Carlos Casamayor, Head of the Department of Information Systems and Computation. I am very thankful to all of them for their unconditional support for this contest. Their answers, excuse me, their answers to me every, th every time I ask them anything for work 2012 belongs to the following set. Yes, of course, don't worry, and no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to welcome the teams that tomorrow will compete for a place in the World Finals of the International Comp Collegiate Programming Contest of the ACM to be held in St. Petersburg, July 2013. Welcome and thanks to the coaches that have trained their teams for this contest, and also welcome to the public in general. You, the teams, have trained yourself hard for this contest, and I want to start by wishing you all the best of luck in the contest. This year, 44 teams participate in SWARC 2012. The number of participating teams has increased from last year's. Thank you all for that. Thank you all for attending this event in Valencia. Following this opening ceremony, two tasks will take place. First one is beyond the power and memory walls, the role of networks on chip in future system architectures by Professor Jose Duato. Second one is Facebook infrastructure and engineer culture, culture by Giris Patangai, engineer manager from Facebook London office. The remaining program for today and tomorrow is already known by you. It is available in your bags and in the informative panels you can see in the school. Now, how, will all, excuse me, how is all this possible? Okay, thank to the support of my department, my school, Excuse me. And my university for providing this installation and financial support. Also, thanks to sponsors. This kind of event is possible thanks to their financial support. Okay? Finally, but not least, the most valuable, valuable resource that is people. Many people have worked very hard for this contest to be a great event. I will never be thankful enough with them. I'm sorry. <laughs> <coughs> the problem setters and judges, commanded by Timo Planelch, have done so much tonight in work in the preparation of the problem statements. We hope they will be a real challenge to all of you. Thanks for the efforts and also to the system administrators. Thanks to the volunteer students. Their supporting work is very important. <clears throat> and thanks to all the teachers and fellows involved in this organization. Thank you all. Without you, I will never dare organizing this contest. Now my presentation ends. Good luck for everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, John Ander. Okay, welcome everybody to our university. <clears throat> After more than 40 years of public service to society, the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia has become one of the higher education institutions increasing uh, recognition and prestige in Europe. We are in the uh, ranking time higher education 150 of the Thomson Reuters. We are a young, dynamic, and innovative public institution dedicated to research and teaching that has a strong links with the social environment in which we operate. At the present, our university community is made up of 40,000 uh, people. Of these, about 35,000 are students, 3,000 teachers, and 2,000 are the group of administration staff and services. 
Our dedication to service responds to a commitment to society. We provide young people the knowledge to achieve insertion as graduates in the profession, in the professional and offer a model of education that provides them with technological skills and cultural and humanistic education. It's a pleasure for us to host this programming competition among team uh, uh, of students representing institutions of higher education from France, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Israel, Switzerland and Western Austria. Finally, I would like to welcome you to our university and to our city. I'm sure you will have a present stay in Valencia. I, will last, I wish luck uh, to all participants. Thank you for your attention and wish you all a, a very successful meeting. I declare open the Southwestern Europe Regional Contest Competition. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, hello, everybody, again. Okay. Uh, now, Professor Jose Duato is going to present the talk Beyond the Power and Memory Walls, the Role of Networks on Chip in Future System Architectures. I'm going to introduce to you the Professor Jose Duato. Jose Duato is Professor in the Department of Computer Engineering Novas Disca at the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia in Spain. His research interest includes interconnection networks and multiprocessor architectures. He published over 5,000 papers, which received more than 8,000 citations. His research results have been in the design of the Alpha. 21364 microprocessor and the Cry T3E and IBM Blue Gene L supercomputers. Dr. Duato is the first author of the book Interconnection, Interconnection Networks and Engineering Approach. He served as associate editor of IEEE TPDS. I3E's TC and I3E's CAL. He was general co chair of ACPP 2001, program chair of HPCA 10, and program co chair of ICPP 2005. He was awarded the National Research Prize in Mathematics and Information Technology in 2009. Uh, finally, I would like to tell you my personal view of Professor Jose Duato. Uh, excuse me. He was my teacher of parallel architectures of processors, an annual subject in the fourth course of computer science. I was his student 25 years ago. Maybe some of you were not born. Currently, I'm teaching in the same school, this school, our school. I speak with Professor Duato sometimes whenever we meet casually in the campus. He remains the same cordial person he was. But I should to tell you that now he is a scientist now around the world. He has a large list of publications. However, the reason why I remember Professor Jose Duato as possible, the best teacher I ever had. is not directly related to this research phase. I remember him well 
due to how he explained it in the classroom. He was an incredible teacher. Sometimes he uses slides or pictures on the blackboard. But usually he sat on the table and explained us how data and control signals run inside different processor architectures. During these explanations, without the slides or pictures, you could see the, processor in, the process in your mind, even clo without closing your eyes. Now, it's time for you to enjoy his talk. I'm sure you will find it very interesting. Professor Duato. Can you hear me now? Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Valencia and to our university. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank John Ander for uh, his uh, invitation and uh, especially for uh, those uh, really warm words. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. Well, um, this talk, be before starting, uh, a few words about it. Uh, you are programmers, so you are mostly interested in programming, not on hardware, not on architectures. So uh, what about this talk? Well, this talk is uh, something that in some way complements your view of the machines. You like programming, but you have to program computers. And I guess that you would be interested on how computers will evolve into the future. So how those computers will be in the future? And uh, this talk is about the future. Okay. The second thing I would like to mention is that uh, a few words about the title. I guess that you know that uh, approximately 10 years ago, uh, the race uh, about increasing clock frequency uh, was over. Uh, in the past, uh, uh, processor manufacturers used to uh, uh, increase computing power simply by introducing a few changes in the processor design and then increasing clock frequency. But they reach a point where uh, higher clock frequency deliver less computing power. And you know the reason? The reason was that the protection mechanism to avoid those processors become, uh, being burned uh, was activated so frequently that computing power was lower than the one for a, a processor with lower frequency, simply because uh, uh, those higher frequency processors were not active all the time. They delivered so much heat that it was impossible to extract, to evacuate all that heat. And because of that, the, the protection mechanism was uh, continuously activated. So Intel announced the 4 GHz processor, Pentium D processor, and finally they never delivered that, that processor. That processor never reached the market, so that race was over. And then they start the multi-core race, okay? And these are the processors you know today, the multi-core processors and the ones you usually program. Well, this uh, this wall, the the, the the one about delivering uh, or so much uh, power, consuming so much energy, and and delivering so much heat, is what's usually known as power wall. But the next one is the memory wall. 
it's possible today to design and manufacture processors with hundreds of cores. It's possible to do it. Even if you don't believe it, it's possible to do it. A few hundreds, not, not many hundreds, but at least 100, it's possible to do it. It's feasible. However, the memory bandwidth would not be enough to feed all of those cores with instructions and data. That's the next wall, the memory wall. So this talk is about the power and memory walls. Okay? So I will try to go into the future and, and show you what you could expect from manufacturers given the technology constraints. Well, I guess that you know a bit about history. I already mentioned it. And uh, since we are now in the multi-core era, um, the problem is that uh, by the time manufacturers introduced those multi-core processors, you know how many programmers were able to develop parallel programs? Less than 2% of all the programmers around the world. Maybe you are surprised because you are young people, you are used to these uh, processors, and I guess that you learn how to develop parallel programs, efficient parallel programs. But that was not the, the case for most of the programmers at that, at that point in time. So because of this, uh, um, processor manufacturers realized that uh, the market was not in the desktop processors or even the laptops. Because few applications would benefit from those multiple cores. Even if you are able to develop parallel applications, most applications don't really need those multiple cores. So, where is the market for those multi-core processors? The market is in the servers. And the servers, it's possible to use multi-core processors very efficiently, simply because in, in, in the server you have multiple of those um, of those PCs uh, interconnected together. Each of those PCs is uh, a two-way, four-way motherboard. Two-way, four-way means uh, two processor sockets, uh, four processor sockets. If at any point in time I use any terminology you don't understand, please stop me. Just raise your hand and, and ask, okay? No problem about that. So in the servers, uh, the designers use uh, four-way, two-way motherboards with multiple sockets and memory. And in those servers, it's possible to efficiently use all of those uh, cores simply because since servers are uh, accessed by many clients concurrently, different requests can be handled by different cores. And this is the way those multi-core processors can be used very efficiently. And this is the real market. That's why uh, manufacturers keep increasing the number of cores in the server market, and they don't increase the number of cores so much in the desktop market, okay? Well, but taking this into account, what's the future? So now, let me go back, sorry, let me go back to the outline of this talk. Uh, first thing is a little bit of history and uh, current server configuration so that you understand where we came from. We came from a situation where it was impossible to continue increasing computing power simply by increasing clock frequency. Manufacturers moved to multi-core processors. Those processors can be efficiently used in the servers, not so much in the desktop machines. So that's the starting point. Now, what's next? This talk is about that. What's next? And I will talk about that and what are the possibilities. But in doing that, we'll face a lot of difficulties. And uh, I will explain you those difficulties later. Um, in view of uh, what are the problems to designing more powerful processors, we'll face several challenges. And uh, uh, one of the challenges has to do with communication between those cores, internal communication between those cores. And I will talk about solution for that. Then another problem will be memory bandwidth constraints. I will also talk about how to address those constraints. And finally, heat dissipation. I will also mention how to address heat dissipation based on some research projects that are currently de being developed. Okay? And based on all those research, research efforts, it's possible to more or less predict what will happen into the future and what components will appear into the market in the future. 
And finally, I will briefly mention the role of uh, two existing technologies for interconnecting processors on the same motherboard, one by uh, AMD, Hypertransport, and another one more recent by Intel, uh, Quick Path Interconnect. What's the possible role of those uh, interconnect technologies in the future? Okay? So that's uh, what the, the, the talk is about. I already mentioned the, the current server configuration. And uh, just a few more words. Uh, at the beginning, when uh, different manufacturers start to deliver multi card processors to the market, some people start to believe that the number of cores will increase very quickly. But that was not the case. It started 10 years ago. By now, we could have 16, 32, 64 core processors. It's feasible to do it, but this has not been the case. We'll uh, talk about the reasons later. But please keep this in mind. The number of cores in the processors is increasing very slowly. Another thing I would like to mention about uh, servers is that uh, um, since it's not easy to develop parallel programs, and taking into account those uh, processors are interconnected together to form a shared memory multiprocessor so that different threads could run on those uh, different cores and use the same shared memory so that they could exchange information through shared variables or synchronize through some uh, shared logs. Uh, then, what's the problem with, with those machines? The problem is that if many applications don't require so many cores, then what do we do? Well, manufacturers came out with some possible solution for that, and they said, well, if we cannot efficiently use all the cores even on a single motherboard, what do we do? Why don't we split that machine into several virtual machines that are smaller and contain a smaller number of cores? The initial idea was simply to uh, avoid the problem. Since we are not able to develop parallel applications that can efficiently take advantage of all the cores, let's split the machine into smaller machines and then we'll be able to run those parallel applications or even sequential applications on virtual machines that consume just one core. That was the initial idea. But later, that was a tremendous success. And the reason for that is simply that by using virtual machines, even the best hackers, the ones that can go deep into the operating system, cannot move to another operating system that's being run on another virtual machine. And this way, they manage to uh, deliver a very high level of protection so that different customers, customers with very sensitive information, can share the same physical machine. And that was the beginning of outsourcing information technology services. Many corporations start to outsource those services and hire some fraction of those physical servers and companies delivering those services. Companies that bought very large physical servers and split them into multiple virtual servers by running multiple virtual machines, each of them delivering service to different customer. And this way, an insurance company and a bank company could share the same physical server as long as they run their applications on different virtual servers, virtual machines. Okay? So they managed to deliver a level of protection that was not uh, possible before using those virtual machines. And that was a tremendous success. So that's the current situation. So, what's next? Well, you know that prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the, it's about the future. That was said by Niels Bohr, very famous physicist. But extrapolating uh, current trends, we can guess that the number of cores will continue increasing. It's not increasing as, as fast as uh, was initially predicted, as I mentioned before. Even some companies like, for instance, iMicrosystems, after uh, bringing a 16-core processor to the market, the next version was an 8-core processor. The main reason for this is that uh, since many applications are sequential and cannot fully benefit uh, from those multiple cores, having few very powerful cores is a better idea than having many not so powerful cores. And that's one of the reasons why uh, manufacturers continue using few very powerful cores in their processors. But there is another very important reason. Uh, Intel, for instance, uh, has, has developed, uh, well, they developed an 80-core prototype and later 
a more uh, commercial version of that uh, machine that's a 48 core processor. Okay, 48 cores. That should be very powerful, isn't it? Well, it's quite powerful, but they are not selling that processor. And what's the reason for that? The reason is very simple. They cannot provide enough memory bandwidth to feed all of those cores. That design is, 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 uh, it contains that flaw. The, the memory controllers cannot deliver enough bandwidth to feed all of those cores. And that's why Intel delivered that processor to some uh, uh, research institutions only. It's just for research, because from a commercial point of view, it's not as powerful as it could be expected. Okay? So, I mention this because it's important to take it into account. So what are the main difficulties when trying to increase the number of cores? The main difficulties are, uh, or can be classified into three categories. Uh, the first one is uh, communication among cores. As we increase the number of cores, we need to e exchange information among them, especially taking into account that all of them form a shared memory multiprocessor. If it's a shared memory multiprocessor, they have to communicate among them in order to exchange data, for instance, to keep uh, the, all the caches coherent. So in order to, to be able to establish that communication, current processors simply use a crossbar. Crossbar is a device where you can connect any of the connecting devices directly to any other device. However, that doesn't scale because the cost of those crossbars cost, uh, increases quadratically with the number of devices you attach to them. So for four cores, eight cores, that's feasible, that's doable. However, it's not doable for, say, uh, 64 cores. 128 cores. So we need something different. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Um, the other problem is uh, heat dissipation and power consumption. It was the problem 10 years ago, and it continues to be the problem. Well, it's true that uh, in the way the designers introduced a lot of techniques to reduce power consumption. That's true. And this way it was feasible to increase the number of cores without burning the chip. There is another very important reason. You know that, at least in theory, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the heat dissipation comes from uh, switching devices, uh, transistors that, that switch from uh, zero level to one level, and so on. And uh, that power, uh, due to switching, is proportional to the clock frequency and to the square of the voltage, the power supply voltage. So, it's possible to reduce voltage, but at the risk of not delivering a correct operation, unless you reduce the clock frequency. So, if you reduce the clock frequency to the half, in theory, it's possible to reduce dynamic power to one eighth. So, we get half the computing power and we consume one-eighth of the electric power. That's wonderful. We can put eight cores into the same chip, all of them running at half the clock frequency, and we get four times the computing power of just one core. Fantastic. That was the initial idea, and that's the reason why the manufacturers started to build multi-core uh, chips. However, as they did so, they kept, first they reduced the clock frequency, but later they start to increase the clock frequency again. So, why don't those chips burn? And the answer is very simple. They introduce a lot of techniques to reduce power consumption. Wonderful. The problem is that they already implemented most of those techniques. And there is a very narrow margin for continuing improving power consumption in each individual core. So in the future, if we increase the number of cores, that will mean that we will also increase power consumption and heat dissipation, unless we reduce clock frequency again. So another problem to take into account. And finally, memory bandwidth. As I mentioned before, if we increase the number of cores, it will not be feasible to feed all of them with instructions and data. So let's talk about uh, these limitations. First of all, how, how do we overcome the uh, interconnect limitation, the, the problem about interconnecting all of those cores. Well, there have been uh, proposals uh, in the research community. Let me 
Sometimes an image is, is better than 1,000 uh, words. So let me show it graphically. Here you've got uh, different blocks that some people call tiles. Each of those tiles is one or more cores with some uh, router, some uh, communication device in order to interconnect those blocks among them and some L1 and L2 uh, cache blocks. Okay? So each of those uh, squares is one core, a piece of cache, and some communication device. That communication device basically consists of a small crossbar just to interconnect that uh, core with uh, the devices uh, located east, west, north, and south. And the only thing they need is that crossbar, some buffers in order to store incoming packets, and some Radian arbitration unit that basically arbitrates among conflicting requests and selects the path in order to reach the destination. Most of the proposals uh, in, in, uh, in academia uh, are of this kind, basically a 2D mesh. Why a 2D mesh? Simply because it fits very well with the physical layout of a chip. We have a flat area, flat square area of silicon, then this 2D mesh fits very well. Additionally, uh, for the designers, this is wonderful because you know that their verification time, the hardware verification time of a complex processor now takes much longer and it's much more expensive than the design itself. So, if instead of designing a very complex processor, we design very simple processors, many times by reusing the, the design of the previous generation, and once we designed this small block, we simply replicate it many times, then verification is much shorter because we just need to verify small block. And that's it. Okay? So that helps designing uh, more powerful processors in a shorter period of time. And that's why this is so attractive. So this is the, uh, the proposal made by uh, many people in academia and also follow in some uh, prototypes. For instance, Intel built an 80 chip, 80 core chip with uh, 8 times 10 uh, cores, okay? following this uh, same uh, arrangement, a 2D mesh, where uh, communication between different cores was extremely simple. If this core wants to send a packet to this core, containing, for instance, an invalidation request or uh, a cache line or whatever, simply sends the packet along the X dimension and then along the Y dimension until it reaches the destination. Extremely simple. Okay? So this has been uh, the proposal made by most people. And you may think, wow, that's simple, powerful, wonderful. Well, unfortunately, this is not doable in the future. And I'll tell you why. The problem is that there are sources of heterogeneity. This homogeneous design we have just seen is not doable in the future. What are those sources of heterogeneity? Uh, we got uh, first architectural sources. So the same designers, same the designers of, of those chips, will want to introduce some features, and when introducing those features, they will introduce some heterogeneity. I'll tell you about some of them. The other problem is that there are some technology constraints. Unfortunately, we cannot design what we want. We have to use some technology, some existing technology for manufacturing chips. And that technology has some serious limitations. So designers have to take those limitations into account. Otherwise, those chips will not work. And finally, uh, in the way, the way we use uh, chips also introduces some sources of heterogeneity. I'll briefly talk about all of them. First of all, architectural sources. We have seen a very nice, uh, for instance, 8 times 8 to the mesh, of course, all of them exactly the same, very regular design, fantastic, but those cores will need access to memory. So how do we provide access to memory to those cores? By using some memory controllers, fantastic. 
very nice. So we include those memory controllers into the chip, and those memory controllers will be the ones that, through the pins of the, the package, will access external memory. Very nice. But the problem is, where do we attach those memory controllers? We cannot attach those memory controllers anywhere. If we look at the design, we'll find out that this core here has four links, and all of them are being used. However, those cores here have four links, and only three of them are being used. So it seems quite reasonable to attach those memory controllers to some spare links. And this is what people are proposing and doing. It's true that those memory controllers could have multiple ports instead of just one. OK, fine. Imagine that uh, this uh, memory controller has four ports instead of one. OK, let's connect one here, another one here, another one here, another one here. And the same for the uh, upper memory controller. Fantastic. But still, we have those memory controllers on the edge of the 2D mesh. That means that the traffic will not be regular. And it will not be the same uh, latency. You know, the latency is the time since we start to send the message until the message is completely received. Uh, the latency experienced by cores directly connected to the memory controller will not be the same as the latency experienced by other cores that are far away from those memory controllers. Obviously, it will be different. So we'll have different latency for different cores. We'll have a lot of congestion because even cores that are far away will want to raise those memory controllers. And therefore, if all the traffic goes to the same place, there will be contention and later congestion. Okay? So we are introducing here a source of heterogeneity. Even if the design seems regular, the traffic will not be so. Traffic will be quite heterogeneous. Okay? So this is one of the reasons for... And, and memory controllers are required in every design. So you cannot escape. There is no way to escape to this. Uh, let me... Well, let's keep... I already mentioned all of that. Let me show you all, uh, other uh, design examples where... Um, the, the architecture itself le uh, lends uh, to heterogeneity. Well, um, before I mention that for desktop applications, it was not a good idea uh, to have processors or to use processors with many simple cores. And the reason is that sequential applications may run very slowly. So, instead of using what Intel or AMD is delivering now, I mean, uh, a few very powerful cores. Why not implementing a chip with one or two very powerful cores and a bunch of less powerful cores? This way, we could run applications that are purely sequential on those very powerful cores, and we could run parallel applications by using those many not-so-powerful cores. This way, both sequential and parallel applications will run very fast. That's not a new idea. You know that IBM implemented the cell processor, the one in PlayStation 3. Okay? So, we can use a few, one or a few uh, very powerful cores and several or many not so powerful cores, possibly with even a subset of the instruction set or different instruction set in order to run sequential applications here and parallel applications uh, here, except for the sequential part of those, uh, of those parallel applications, that will also be run on the powerful core. Fantastic. But that, again, is a source of heterogeneity, because the silicon area required for the powerful core will be larger than the silicon area required for the less powerful cores. Okay? So, when uh, we try to allocate silicon area for those different blocks, it turns out that the powerful cores will require larger silicon area than the less powerful cores. Okay, so we locate those different devices on, on the chip and interconnect them using a 2D mesh. Hey, wait a moment, that's not a 2D mesh. Because when we remove those blocks and we look at the, at, at the supposed to be 2D mesh, is no longer a 2D mesh. Because there are some last blocks 
that prevent the implementation of routing devices in, in that area. So, the simple routing algorithm I mentioned before about, for instance, you want to send the packet from here to here, we have to send the packet through the X dimension and then to the Y dimension. Wow. But where are the switching devices? They are no longer there. So we can no longer use those simple routing algorithms I mentioned before. In addition to uh, um, uh, the, the architectural issues I mentioned before, uh, there are also some uh, technology sources for heterogeneity. Uh, one of the most critical ones are the manufacturing defects. You know that, uh, uh, do you, I guess that you know at least a little bit about the, the manufacturing process uh, for, for chips. And you know that they need uh, a very clean working space. Uh, I recently visited one of those uh, product, uh, production uh, rooms. Uh, it's here at the university, so uh, uh, yes, we, we got the only uh, cheap uh, production facility in Spain that's able to produce uh, commercial uh, chips uh, in Spain here at this, uh, this university. Well, the issue is that uh, the air is 10,000 times cleaner than the one required for the surgery operation. So they require very clean air simply because every little bit of dust that falls into a piece of silicon may produce a manufacturing defect. And in the past, well, manufacturing defect could affect one transistor. Right now, with very tiny transistors, a single uh, bit of dust may invalidate tens of transistors, a large silicon area. Okay? So that's a problem because it may uh, 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 it may produce, uh, well, it may uh, end up with production runs where a large percentage of the, of the chips are defective. So imagine that in a production run, 90% of the chips are defective. And only 10% are really working. That's not a good idea. That's not what manufacturers like. So how can we address that? The problem is the one I mentioned, and the solution is relatively simple. If that design would correspond to a single core, if something fails, you have to throw the chip. But however, if it's a multi-core chip, hey, wait a moment, if it's a multi-core chip, and the failure, the manufacturing defect affects one core, two cores, I simply disable those cores I, and use the remaining cores. It's not a bad idea. That's something that's... Don't think that this is uh, about future. This is about the present and the past. You know the uh, PlayStation 3, okay? So what's the processor using that machine? Cell processor. How many SPUs uh, uses, uh, uh, use those, those chips? If you look at the specs from the manufacturers, you will see that the PlayStation 3 processors implement seven SPUs, seven of those small cores, okay? Well, if you look at the specs by IBM about the cell processor, it contains eight SPUs, not seven. Do you think it's a different chip? No, it's exactly the same one. It's exactly the same one, simply the defective ones, the defective processors are the ones in the PlayStation 3s, okay? Simply by disabling the failing core. And that's a reality. I mean, um, a few years back, two or three years ago, my son uh, bought the dual core processor from AMD. A few days later, he enabled two more cores. Indeed, it was a four core processor. Simply, two of them were defective, and the uh, manufacturer was selling those chips as dual core processors at a lower cost, lower price. Okay? So this is a reality. So it's relatively simple to disable some of the cores simply by uh, introducing some bit in the design so that you can simply set that bit and then you disable the, the core. But the problem is that even if you disable the cores, when you come to a communication 
structure like a two D mesh, as I mentioned before, then the situation is more complex because if you look at the two D mesh, let's assume that a relatively large area failed. Okay, you disable all of those cores. Fantastic. But if you look at the routing algorithm we're considering, which is X and then Y, if we want to send the packet from A to B, if we disable this area, it's no longer possible to communicate among those devices. So what do we do? Then we need more complex routing algorithms that are able to work on those limitations and find alternative paths that may exist in the, in the topology of the network. But in doing so, we introduce, first of all, deadlock problems. Do you know what the deadlock is? Situation where all the packets are waiting for some space, some buffer space, and all of the packets are in the same situation, and none of them is able to make progress anymore. That's a deadlock. Well, if you send packets following any arbitrary path, you may end up in a deadlock situation. That's one of the problems. It's possible to develop deadlock free running algorithms. It's not easy, but it's doable. The other problem is that if you send the, the packet through this path, it will obviously interact with other packets using the same links. So in some way, if you use alternative paths, those paths will collide with other paths used by other messages, and there will be congested areas. So congestion will increase in some places. So possible solutions. Uh, we may use uh, different uh, routing algorithms that are able to tolerate those, those failures, obviously. And uh, uh, um, there are other possible solutions, like, for instance, splitting the chip into multiple regions. If we got a multi-core chip, we split that multi-core chip into multiple regions, each of them containing a few cores, and those different regions can not only be enabled or disabled, but they can even run at different clock frequencies. Okay? Because there is another problem. In addition to failures, it's possible to design chips in such a way that some transistors are faster than others, even if you don't want them to be this way. For instance, do you think that those different processors that run at different clock frequencies that are in the market now are indeed different designs? No. In many cases, processors running at different but relatively close frequencies are exactly the same chip. Not only the same design, but even the same manufacturing run. Simply, when those processors come out of the production line, the manufacturer tests them, and some of them are able to run faster without failing, and some other processors, if they run at that clock frequency, they fail. Some data do doesn't reach the next stage in time, and therefore, uh, the result is not correct. So, they simply reduce the clock frequency, so that those slower devices are able to deliver the data to the next pipeline stage in time, and then they work correctly. So, different uh, processors that seem to be, be different, but indeed are the same processors simply running at different clock frequency, are simply the outcome of a manufacturing run where different processors have slightly different transistors. Not because the manufacturer wants them to be this way, simply because the process is so complex that this is the way they come out of the manufacturing line. Okay? So, taking this into account, uh, the solution up to now has been the one you know, labeling different processors with different clock frequency. Some of them are slower, some of them are faster. The fastest ones are more expensive. The slower ones are obviously cheaper. Some people buy very cheap processors and overclock them. Fine. But you know that by doing so, it's very likely that some instructions fail from time to time. And that there are some uh, unexpected failures, or bad results, or results that are not correct, and you may not even notice that. So be careful with overclocking. And it's the result of that. Simply, 
uh, manufacturing variability. So how do we address that? It's possible to split, as I mentioned before, a multi-core chip into multiple regions, and instead of lowering the clock frequency for the entire processor, if some regions within the same chip are faster than other regions, we can run those regions at the higher clock frequency than the ones that are slower. This way we get the most out of those chips. However, again, for the network that's a problem. Because if some packets run faster in the part of the, the, uh, in, in the region that's faster, and then reach another region that's slower, for instance, in order to reach a memory controller, then there will be congestion there. It's the same as uh, when you are driving on a highway and reach an area with lower uh, maximum speed. Then there is congestion. The same happens here. Uh, another problem about technology is uh, thermal issues. Well, I already mentioned that uh, most of the techniques to reduce uh, power consumption have already been uh, integrated into the, into the chips. But the problem is, uh, will become much worse in, in the future. Why? The reason is very simple. Just consider this. If most of the techniques to reduce power consumption have already been implemented into current cores, if we continue increasing the number of cores, power consumption and heat dissipation will continue to increase. Now imagine the following situation. We'll reach a point in, in the future where it will be possible to integrate tens, hundreds, of course, into the same chip. However, if you keep all of them active at the same time, the chip will burn. So you may say, well, in that case, instead of lowering the clock frequency for all of them, let me just activate half of the cores and run them at higher clock frequency. And when they heat up, then I deactivate them and I activate the remaining half of the cores. Fantastic. But in that case, you are not getting more computing power. You are using just half of the cores all the time. So are you going to buy a chip with, say, uh, 64 cores in order to be able to use only 32 of them? That makes no sense. So, is there any solution for that? Yes, the solution is already in the market. There is a way to increase computing power without increasing power consumption, which is by designing a specific hardware units. If you design hardware units that do some specific functions, those units will be much faster than a standard core and will consume significantly less uh, power, less uh, energy. For instance, graphics. You all know that the GPU, a graphics processing unit, is much faster when dealing with graphics than the main pro processor. And it does so consuming a lot of power, yes, but delivering much higher computing power than the main processor can do. And that's a specialized unit. So it's a unit that does certain functions much faster. Well, if instead of integrating a lot of identical cores into a same chip, we integrate a few of those general purpose cores and several more specific cores into the same chip, then we'll be able to run applications in such a way that whenever an application requires this specialized unit, then we activate that unit and we use it then the computation will perform the same much faster and with less power consumption because it's using that specialized unit. Then another application requires another specialized unit. Then we deactivate the one we no longer require and we activate another specialized unit. So by using specialized units, it's possible to increase the computing power and not keeping all the hardware active at the same time. That's the best way to efficiently use the many transistors that will be available in the future. And indeed, for instance, AMD already launched uh, a processor chip that contains uh, a few general purpose cores and a graphics processing unit into the same chip. Okay? Again, that's heterogeneous design. And finally, uh, usage model sources. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that, just one of the, 
the, the examples. Virtualization. I mentioned virtualization before when talking about servers. A very efficient way of, of using the multiple cores that uh, exist in the server. Fine. The problem is that when virtualizing a, a chip, when splitting the cores within a chip into multiple virtual machines, even if they are independent from each other, it may happen that the traffic in the in the interconnection network within the chip, the traffic from one region to another crosses a third region. That's a problem. Or it may happen that the traffic from a given region to a memory controller crosses another region. Again, that's a problem that introduces some heterogeneity. Well, there are solutions for this, and I'm not going to enter into details about that. We developed, for instance, some uh, strategy to uh, to deal with those uh, on-chip networks and a very specific routing algorithm that's extremely powerful and doesn't require too many resources. We developed that in collaboration with AMD. History is uh, a bit uh, curious, because we developed in, in collaboration with AMD. AMD lawyers didn't want to patent it. Then uh, we published it. Then uh, Intel, uh, as soon as they saw the, the, the paper, they implemented that on a prototype. And uh, later, Intel closed the, the department the, in the uh, research labs that implemented uh, that idea. And now we are patenting it together with ST Microelectronics. Wow. It's uh, interesting. Well, now let's focus on, on uh, the remaining problems I mentioned at the beginning. We addressed the, uh, the interconnection uh, network or the communication problem. Now we are going to address bandwidth constraints and then uh, heat dissipation constraints. Okay? Very briefly. Uh, let's talk about uh, bandwidth constraints. As I mentioned before, uh, there are processors now in the market. Uh, for instance, Intel uh, has a 48-core processor. But it only contains, if I remember correctly, uh, four memory controllers, or maybe six. I don't remember now. I think it's four. Anyway, many more cores than memory controllers. So those memory controllers have to be shared among many cores. And that's a problem because there would not be enough bandwidth to feed those cores. Okay, you could say, why don't we include more memory controllers into the design? Just by adding more memory controllers? That would solve the problem. Is it doable? The answer is possible. However, what do we do with many more memory controllers if we don't have the pins in the package? to access external memory, because the number of pins is quite limited. And technology advances in that way as well, but as technology advances, the number of transistors we can integrate into a chip grows much faster than the number of pins in the package. So even if we add more memory controllers, that doesn't help, because we don't have the pins in the package. So what can we do in order to provide more memory bandwidth? The solution is the following. It's very simple, uh, but uh, from a technological point of view, it's quite complex. It consists of integrating memory and the cores into the same package. Instead of having external memory, we incorporate the memory into the package. That's it. So in order to do that, the, uh, this is the roadmap uh, by Intel, for instance, where uh, in the first stage, they use a silicon carrier, uh, which is just a piece of silicon, and on top of that silicon carrier, they put first, on the one side, a multi-core processor chip, and on the other side, on the, on the silicon carrier, they put a 3D stack of memory. So it's not, it's not just one memory chip, but multiple memory chips stacked on top of each other so as to achieve more memory capacity. So that's the idea. We simply have the CPU and the memory inside the same package. And in the future, they will do it this way. They will simply put the CPU and the memory on top of each other, very much like this. So we have multi-core chip and multiple memory chips stacked over the uh, multi-core chip with some way of communicating 
those uh, different chips. It could be uh, with uh, by drilling holes and, and having some wires. It could be uh, capacity coupling. It could be uh, magnetic coupling. There are multiple ways of establishing that communication. Or even optically. We are currently uh, developing some uh, research projects uh, in order to develop uh, an optical communication for, uh, for this kind of architecture. So by introducing the memory inside the chip, sorry, inside the chip, inside the same package, will provide much more memory bandwidth than the one is available outside the chip. And this way, this way it will be possible to overcome the memory bandwidth constraints. Obviously, at the beginning, when manufacturers start to do this, it will not be possible to put all the memory required by a processor inside the same package. So there will be configurations with internal memory and external memory. And now there is an opportunity for programmers who efficiently use this dual architecture so that most of the memory used by the applications is inside the chip and external memory is not used so frequently. So uh, as you manage to increase the percentage of times you access internal memory with respect to external memory, applications will run faster. Okay? It's not a cache. It's not like a cache. That will be directly addressable memory. Very much like external RAM. Simply, it will be inside. Okay? And you may ask, why do we put just one multi-core chip and multiple memory chips? and not multiple multi-core chips and multiple memory chips? The answer is very simple. First of all, there is technology in the market for stacking multiple memory chips. You know the flash memories, the, the USB sticks? You know? Those uh, USB sticks uh, already <laughs> use this 3D stacking technology in order to achieve very large memory capacity. So that's a well-known technology. And the other problem is key dissipation. This multi-core chip will dissipate much more heat than the uh, memory chips. And therefore, we cannot simply put several of them. We can just put one of them, and heat dissipation through, uh, should go from here to the outside. Okay? If we put multiple multi-core chips, and all of them dissipate a lot of heat, the ones that are inside in the sandwich will not be able to evacuate the heat and will burn. Okay? So there is room for just one multi-core chip and the remaining chips should be memory chips. Okay? In addition to this, uh, if you look at any PC or any server unit, you will find out that for every processor chip there are a lot of memory chips in order for it to run because applications require a lot of memory. So the balance is like that. We require many more chips for memory than for processors. Now and in the future. But there are other ways of addressing. Uh, now the, the other problem is uh, we, we already mentioned how to address uh, memory constraints. Now let me uh, say a few words about addressing uh, heat dissipation. Um, as I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning, the manufacturers already introduced all the techniques they know about reducing uh, power consumption in the current chips. So there is uh, almost no room for continuing improving. So what can they do in order to uh, address heat dissipation? Basically, there are two ways to follow. One of them is uh, using simple cores. I uh, just uh, include here examples starting from the Niagara 2 or from the Atom that are uh, designs that consume significantly less power than Intel or AMD cores. And by using them, uh, how could we scale, for instance, uh, an atom core with a 32 nanometer design uh, would, consume, would consume half a watt. So if a, a package can dissipate uh, approximately 100 watt, that means that we could include 200 of those cores in a single chip today. It's quite nice, but again, uh, we'll have all the problems I mentioned before about memory controllers and so on. But it's, it's doable from the heat dissipation point of view. Obviously, it's more efficient to include a significantly smaller number of those uh, uh, cores and some graphic processing units and things like that. Or uh, 
have some hybrid design with a bunch of those cores and some more powerful cores to run sequential applications. Obviously, all, all of those combinations are significantly better. But anyway, that's, that's a way of, of uh, addressing that, that problem. The other one is uh, liquid uh, cooling inside the chip, not outside, inside the chip. So we could have the package, and inside it, we have a 3D stack. One of them would be the multi-core chip, and the other ones would be the memory chips, and a liquid, not water. Uh, water is conductive. It should be uh, a non-conductive uh, liquid. And liquid would go through those uh, multiple uh, chips. You may think that this is science fiction. I've been talking with one of the researchers uh, who is uh, working on this and uh, developing all the thermal models and all that stuff. So uh, it looks like IBM is quite interested on, on bringing, this, uh, bringing this to reality. Okay? Uh, that researcher is, is Spanish and he's working at the uh, uh, Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne in, in Switzerland. So this is one of the things that uh, may appear in the future. I don't know. Anyway, just uh, to finish, let me uh, quickly talk about uh, the role of uh, hypertransport and QPI, which are the current technologies by AMD and, and Intel, uh, in order to communicate chips within the same motherboard, and the role of those technologies in the future. If indeed uh, we end up, as uh, many researchers claim, with more or less regular or irregular designs uh, where uh, we have multiple tiles, those tiles could be identical, as uh, people are proposing today, or different, as I believe will happen, because some of them will contain general processor cores, some of them will contain GPUs, some of them will contain other kind of accelerators. Okay? One way or another, we'll end up with some designs that contain smaller blocks, and designers will put together a mix of those blocks in order to have the future designs. Okay? Based on that, uh, let's consider, just as an example, a regular design, homogeneous design, where each of the tiles contains, for instance, four cores. Uh, each of them contains uh, the corresponding uh, L1 uh, for data and, and for instruction catch, okay? the, the L1 catches. And then, uh, through some uh, crossbar, they uh, access uh, four uh, L2 banks of catch. And then uh, there is uh, some memory controller in that tile, uh, some uh, directory bank, assuming that uh, it will be uh, the, the cache coherence protocol will require some uh, piece of directory, and the RAR I mentioned before in order to uh, communicate with other devices. Let's assume this. And now with uh, some uh, topology here, it could be a 2D mesh or it could be other topologies that are not so homogeneous as I mentioned before. Anyway, we have some design like this. If you compare that tile, the design of that tile, with, uh, say, for instance, a four-core processor from AMD, if you look at it just by turning this upside down, you'll realize that it's almost identical. So you got here the four cores. Obviously, each of them contains the L1 catches. You got the uh, L2 catch blocks exactly the same number. This local interconnect is not shown there, but it's there. There is a crossbar, okay? Then the system uh, request interface, yes, an interface to the uh, interconnection network. Uh, the crossbar switch is that uh, router. That router there is that uh, crossbar switch. This is the memory controller. And finally, the links from that uh, router are those hypertransport lanes. So it's identical. And that interconnect was used to interconnect multiple processors on the same motherboard. Why not using that technology for interconnecting multiple tiles within the same chip? So that will have a way of reusing that technology, that communication technology. Well, indeed, uh, when I first proposed this, a few months later, AMD came up with a server processor with 12 cores, 
that was indeed two chips, each of them with six cores, interconnected using hypertransport. So basically the same idea, but using only two tiles. So if we use this, we could have, uh, for instance, multiple multi-core uh, chips, multiple 3D stacks of RAM, and some interconnect there. So that we will have some on-chip interconnect, in this case just a crossbar, and some on substrate interconnect. So we'll have two levels of interconnect within a package. The network on chip and the network on substrate. So two levels of interconnect. The benefit of doing this would be that the designers would simply take an old design, will resize it for the newer technology and will turn it into production. Then they simply pile it up and pack everything together on a silicon carrier and you got a design with more cores and with more memory because as I mentioned before more cores without more memory is not useful but more cores and more memory inside the same package so that's doable I don't know whether a manufacturer will do it or not but certainly if they do so they will dramatically reduce cost and verification time so they have the opportunity of delivering uh, products to the market much faster and with many more cores by using this technology whenever they have enough space within the package to introduce multiple multi-core chips and multiple uh, 3D stacks of RAM. Obviously, all of those uh, chips don't need to be exactly the same. Some of them could be general purpose cores, some of them could be graphic processing units or whatever. Okay. So I believe that this is the way to go. Not clear to me whether manufacturer will follow that. They did it uh, with just two cores, but um, sorry, with two chips, but no more than that. Okay. Well, anyway. So conclusions: uh, future multi-core chips uh, face uh, three big challenges: power consumption and heat dissipation, which is roughly the same, memory bandwidth, and on-chip interconnects. And despite the simplicity and beauty of uh, homogeneous designs, as I mentioned uh, during the talk, it will not be possible to continue with homogeneous designs. There are too many sources of, of heterogeneity, so I believe that there is no way to escape. Designers will have to address heterogeneity one way or another. It's very challenging, but not impossible, to design on-chip networks that take into account that heterogeneity. We did it, and we are currently patenting it. But I'm sure that some people will come with even better designs. There are some solutions for heat dissipation, uh, some of them very esoteric. And the question is whether this will become cost effective or not. For instance, liquid cooling inside the chip, fine. And uh, I believe that the, the clear future is 3D stacking. It's already in the market for USB stick uh, flash memories, so uh, it will not take too long before uh, processor manufacturers start to integrate those 3D stacks of RAM within the same package. It will happen, for sure. It will take some, possibly years, but it will happen. And uh, I believe that uh, um, hypertransport QPI will continue to be used inside. Obviously, manufacturers will not even mention this. They don't need to mention that. That would be something inside the, the, the package, so no need to mention that. But I'm sure they will reuse their, te their technology in order to shorten the, the design time uh, to produce those uh, multi-module uh, chips with uh, multiple uh, chips on the, same, on the same substrate. Well, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm ready for that. Uh, you have mentioned the possibility of running different parts of chips at different frequencies. But uh, don't you risk to have microwave interference if two, uh, two waves of different frequencies are so near to each other? 
For example, if one is at 2 gigahertz and another one is at 2.4, then you will have somewhere also a wave of 400 megahertz and so on. Don't you risk to have, have uh, this? What is the problem you mentioned? I will but write if you have like 2 gigahertz and yeah, 2... Yeah, I understand the situation, but what's the problem you mentioned? Uh, well, there is a mi microwave emissions with this, and uh, then there is secondary mi microwaves, and uh, we need only pretty low volume to disturb the transistors. Don't we risk to have this? Yeah, there is risk of, of uh, this happening, obviously. But um, th this is already going on. I mean, uh, this is uh, already available in, in the 48 core uh, chip by Intel. So they designed those chips and took that into account. So obviously there is uh, some interference, that's true, but they are uh, enough far away because this is a flat design. Remember that this is a flat design. So most of the emissions go in direction that will not disturb the remaining transistors. It's, it's, uh, so the, the emission goes in a plane that's uh, kind of orthogonal to the plane where the other transistors are, are working. Uh, and, and therefore the, the, the impact is not that high. Uh, the proof for that is that uh, the 40 core uh, by Intel uh, is, is already working and you can uh, set the frequency for different regions, uh, different values. Okay. So first, thank you for this very nice talk. I would like to know, where do you see most of the potential for future computational power? Is it A, in better software design? Is it B, in system level optimization, as you suggested it in the talk? Or is it C, in physical level by a transistor level, I mean, by moving, for example, away from CMOS? Where is most of the potential? Hmm. Well, uh, I believe it will take very long before we move away from CMOS. Uh, this is the first thing. And the reason for that is, first, that there is no uh, alternative technology that's mature enough. And even more important than that, all the huge investment made on CMOS production lines. Uh, so that uh, even if there is a more promising alternative technology, the investment required in that technology to sit at the same level of current CMOS will be so huge that manufacturers will not move there unless absolutely mandatory. That already happened in the past, for instance. You may remember uh, bubble memories, uh, magnetic bubble memories. Do you remember them? Magnetic bubble memories uh, were more compact, were more robust than hard drives because uh, there were no moving uh, parts. It was completely static. So it was really promising uh, technology. However, it was slower than RAM, it was uh, more expensive than uh, hard drives and with less capacity. If manufacturers had invested a lot of money on magnetic bubble memories, we would currently have magnetic bubble memories instead of hard, uh, hard disks. However, the hard disk manufacturers continue investing in that and soon the difference in capacity between hard disks and magnetic bubble memories was so huge that they were discarded. So uh, the same for any alternative uh, technology, unless CMOS reaches a uh, flattening situation where it's no, there is absolutely no way to continue improving it, then manufacturers will start to invest a lot of money on alternative technologies. But it will take quite long because uh, the investment is so huge up to now that I don't see any easy way to uh, level up any other alternative technology. In addition to the fact that they are not mature enough for, for uh, being able to uh, compete uh, in nanotubes, uh, carbon nanotubes, or uh, quantum uh, computing, they are not mature enough. Um, with respect to uh, where should the, the folks be, uh, well, I believe that uh, uh, hardware designers and manufacturers do what they can with available technology. And then the programmers should, in one way or another, adapt to the existing hardware. There is no other way. Because if you intend to program uh, devices that don't exist and will not exist, that makes no sense. Uh, many programmers in the past would have preferred uh, the clock frequency to continue increasing. 
And I can assure you that Intel, AMD would have loved that because they were in a situation where they were able to deliver faster machines every few months and make a lot of revenue. That's no longer the case. So they would have loved to continue in the same situation, but that was not feasible. So we have to adapt to the existing limitations. And existing limitations mean that it's possible to continue increasing the number of transistors, but not the clock frequency. In the past, we were able to increase the number of transistors and clock frequency. Now we can only increase the number of transistors. So we need to use those transistors in a clever way. And I believe that by simply replicating uh, the same core design many times is not the best way to do it. I mentioned several alternatives to, to do that. So programmers are having to learn more and more techniques like, for instance, uh, programming uh, GPU accelerators or GPGPUs well, uh, using CUDA and maybe some other uh, uh, um, uh, application programming interfaces in the future. With all the inconvenience it has, because you have to explicitly move data from main memory to the graphics card memory and back, so it's not good, but it's better than nothing. So that will uh, possibly improve in the future by unifying memory and things like that, like AMD did with uh, some of their designs. But anyway, uh, programmers will have to adapt to the, the hardware evolution in order to take uh, most uh, the most benefit out of the, the existing hardware. Don't think that programmers are right now uh, using most of the hardware. This is not the case. Most programs are absolutely inefficient. And uh, we, we did some tests, for instance, and uh, on the same platform. I mean, you got a program running on a platform, let's optimize that program. And we did, for instance, things on, on a searching algorithm that was just comparing things simply by using some of the uh, instructions available in current processors, you know, the SSE instructions, that are kind of vector instructions, by using those instructions, we're able to increase the, the speed of a simple algorithm just by introducing a few changes. We made it run three times faster. So it's not 30% faster, it's three times faster with just minimal changes, okay? And I'm talking about existing hardware, not about the hardware that could exist in, in, in the future. So I believe that uh, uh, programmers should continue learning more about hardware and the, the possibilities existing in current and future hardware and adapting to that if they want to really uh, extract the most out of, of, of that uh, hardware. I don't know whether I answered your, your question. Yeah, thank you for that explicit um, answer. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of on behalf of the School of Engineering and Computer Science. It's a, a gift for you. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you. Well, welcome again. Uh, now it's time for the talk, Facebook Infrastructure and Engineering Culture by Guiris Patangay, Engineer Manager from Facebook London Office. Guiris Patangay, Patangay is Engineering Manager at Facebook Science 2008 in the Facebook London Office and before in Menlo Park, California. Before, he worked at in Yahoo since 2006 up to 2008. He was the technical lead for a major project in production operations, also worked on various other projects, 
for the production, operation tool team, developing and designing user interfaces and databases. Before, in, a, in total, a system administrator, and before that, they started the company as pa the, it was co-founder of Nobel Online. They started this company as a part-time consulting business with a couple of friends with attending, no, while attending uh, the University of California from uh, Santa Barbara. Then we, no, then he continued to consult on a small project from time to time. So please, here it is. Thank you very much. You guys hear me? All right, I'm gonna. All right, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Grish. I'm here to talk to you about Facebook engineering, mainly um, the infrastructure part of engineering where I work. Uh, so I'm I'm one of the uh, the early infrastructure engineers at Facebook, and I'm kind of going to. I'm going to go through some of the history that uh, I was part of. Um, so right now I work on the internal tools team uh, in, Lon the, in the London office at Facebook. And what we do is, uh, to put it simply, we try to make engineers as efficient as possible. So the second they start coding to the time this code ends up in front of a billion people, we try to make that process go smoothly and uh, as efficiently as they, it can be. So we develop tools to make engineers uh, write better code, safer code, and uh, get the code out faster. All right, so you know when I when I, um, when I tell people what I do for a living, you know I say I work in infrastructure engineering, um, and they ask me, so you design buildings, or uh, you know like people don't understand what infrastructure really means, and then I have to talk about, uh, yeah, we do have buildings that Facebook designs, we have data centers that we design, we have you know servers and everything, but what I really mean is infrastructure that we build to keep Facebook running. So if you think of an iceberg, um, the tip of an iceberg is what you really use. You know, Facebook.com is kind of like that, that top portion. But what's really supporting it is a lot of functionality that goes in place that's kind of behind the scenes that no one really gets to see. And that's what I work on. Um, so to give you a little idea of what things you would see down there is uh, news feed generation. We don't generate news feed on the fly, for example. It's all asynchronous. It's done in the background. Search type aheads. Um, so the, the indexing, the, the building of the indexes for each person. Um, search is obviously very customized to a particular person, unlike you know, other search companies. Uh, the data center health and monitoring. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that go in um, that run in parallel of a website. And it's just not just the website. So uh, Facebook obviously has to deal with uh, an immense amount of growth. So to give you a little idea, uh, started out in 2004. And I joined about right there. And we're right here now. And it's uh, over a billion people. And it's, it's been an exponential growth curve. Um, so what I want to talk about in particular is um, what we do at work to, um, to h help sustain this immense growth, right? And in particular, I want to talk about 
uh, the risks that Facebook as a company is willing to take to, uh, to get there faster. Um, so a couple years ago, um, we had a problem where PHP as a language uh, was taking up too many resources and was, we were running out of server capacity. So we had to make it faster. So what we did is we took three engineers and we um, decided to put them on three different projects. Um, ben Matthews on PHP server, Steve Grimm on Quercus, and Hyping on HPHP. Uh, these three projects were designed to make our website run faster. Um, and each one had a different risk level. So um, the PHP server was the lowest risk level because it just dealt with the Apache web server. It, uh, it, all it did was pretty much took the, um, the, the, the stack, the, our common code stack, and initialized it before the request came in. Uh, so when the request did come in, you're not doing all this extra work. You're just actually focusing on the request. Um, it, it was going to be done in about a couple months, and it was not going to bring us that many gains. It was just going to run on the exact same server. Um, Quarkus was a project that ran on the Java virtual machine um, that pretty much translated PHP to Java code and ran on Java. Um, it was going to be easier because PHP to Java is a lot easier to translate than the last project, which was uh, uh, Hip Hop, now known as Hip Hop, which is a, a C++ translator. So it takes PHP, translates to C++, and then it compiles that into a, a one large binary. Um, all of these projects have different risks and rewards, right? Uh, C++ being the highest reward and the biggest bang for our buck. And what we did is we set all these things to go together, and in a couple months, we figured out which one was going to be feasible and which one's not. And obviously, the first one you know, wasn't going to get us where we wanted it to be. Uh, the second one, uh, I think he worked on it for about six months until he realized that PagePHP was going to just give us a lot more uh, bang for our buck, uh, or you know, not a lot more efficiency. So we decided to go with HPHP in the end. And now we run hip hop on all our web servers. Um, and it, when we first released it, it gave us uh, three times, uh, you know, the, we could process three times the number of requests on the exact same hardware that we did before. So um, I was involved in the, pro um, in the hip hop process towards the end. Here's a picture of hyping, banging the gong in celebration of the launch of hip hop. Uh, there's Zuck in the back. Uh, so, you know, all of these things have unintended consequences, right? And uh, I, I worked on uh, software deployment uh, when we were switching over from Apache PHP over to hip hop. And uh, uh, it, it changed my world a lot. So uh, pretty much, you know, deploying a web server to PHP, uh, to our Apache web server is really easy. You just take all the PHP files you changed and put them on each server and you restart the web server and it's done. Uh, usually, you know, the lo biggest change we had was probably 50 megabytes. Uh, now, our source code, you know, it's, it's fairly big. So if you translate everything and you build a binary, it's a gig and a half. Um, and every single line you change, you have to build the entire binary again. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, just an if statement. Um, and, you know, the, the other changes was uh, dealt with configuration which we're going to have to deal with anyway. So let's take, uh, let's take the software deployment problem I had. Uh, so we have, we have this exact same package running on our tens of thousands of servers. And we have to change Facebook.com. Uh, we change it every day, twice a day. So uh, we have to do, it, do, do the deployment of the new software really fast. It has to be done within 30 minutes to an hour. And the software package is about a gig and a half, right? So what typically happens, what we used to do when we first started deploying software to Facebook servers, you had one server with your original master copy, and you would just send it uh, to all the servers that ran the web server. Obviously, this doesn't work at our scale. Uh, there's a huge bottleneck. So what we decided to do is, for PHP files, let's move to a two-tier system, right? Uh, send it to... A, you know, 
hundreds of machines, and then those will send it to thousands of machines. Um, this again has you know its own bottleneck, but it can it can scale to a certain larger extent. Then, uh, because of the nature of hip hop, where you're you're sending this giant binary, uh, those lines get clogged up pretty quickly. So, what we decided to do was try a lot of different techniques. Uh, so, first one was binary diffs. You know, my idea was okay. I, I'm you know I'm I have this 1.5 gigabyte binary. I have another 1.5 gig binary, and they're probably pretty similar because I only changed one line. Um, so let's let's do a diff of both the binaries and send across the changes, and then apply it. Um, this this has a lot of implications when you come to an infrastructure our size. When you have thousands of servers running uh, the exact same server or you know exact same binary, uh, it's great, but that doesn't happen in an ideal world. Uh, in our world, we have multiple versions floating around. And when you have multiple versions floating around, they might not have the original copies so that you can't apply that diff to this binary. So this didn't really work out. The next thing we tried was multicast. Um, multicast, I don't know how many network guys are out here, but multicast works really well in theory. When I, when I came across it, I was like, oh, this is great. Let's just, let's just do a multicast broadcast and then will be done, you know, all the machines can get their binary from there. Um, this required us to do a lot of network changes, especially since our data centers are spread across the world. It's really hard for us to uh, configure our network devices and maintain that configuration. And every time we decide, you know, there was an outage or a problem, we'd have to actually go back to a network engineer. Uh, when I did this, there were only six network engineers at Facebook, so it was you know, kind of hard to take their time away from this. And in the end, it, you know, it wasn't really for us. Um, the funny thing about multicast is I, I gave uh, a similar talk at a network architecture geek conference uh, in, in California, and it was run by Cisco. And the guy who developed multicast, like initially created multicast at Cisco, you know, at their Cisco routers, he was in the audience. And when I said this, I, I don't think I said it nicely. I just said, it sucked, and I, it didn't work. And the guy stood up. It's like this really tall, big Italian guy. And he started walking <laughs> towards me. He's like, wait a minute, it worked. I, I know. Um, and uh, it was, it was kind of scary. And I kind of stepped back and was like, what did I just get myself into? Uh, but then uh, there were you know, engineers from Yahoo and Google and I, forget, I think it was Amazon in the audience. And they all stood up. And the guy's name was Dino. He's like, Dino, sit down. We, trust me, we tried this. It didn't work for us either. <laughs> so uh, that was nice. Yeah. All right, so you know, the next thing we could think of was, hey, how about peer-to-peer? -peer, right? you, you send a binary to a couple of machines, and they'll send it to the rest. And then we can, you know, we can do this. Um, so this also had a bunch of issues with our infrastructure. Our web servers tend to be isolated. They don't have access to each other's uh, you know, disk drives and things like that. So we'd have to you know, set up special SSH keys and do all these crazy things. Uh, in the end, you know, we're thinking this is the best option to go with, though. Uh, so how to do this? So we, we, you know, we uh, figured BitTorrent would be a good idea. Uh, you know, we use it to download Linux images and other things. And, uh, uh, it, it, was, it seemed like a really tried and tested technology that scaled really well. So two engineers, me uh, and Thomas Coe, he was an engineer on one of my teams, uh, decided to give this, this technology a shot. Like, how do we do this? So uh, it was a hackathon. Um, it was one of the longer hackathons. We have two types of hackathon. One is one night, and the other one is three days. This was a three-day long hackathon, and we decided to implement this during the hackathon. Uh, obviously, we couldn't implement the entire infrastructure, so we wanted to uh, graft it on top of our existing infrastructure. So what we did is, uh, oh, forgot about this slide. Um, so this pretty much gave us unlimited scalability because BitTorrent just scales without, without question. And uh, uh, it, it just had a lot of things we required, right? You know, like authentication was kind of built into BitTorrent. Uh, 
it, like the network efficiency, so it figured out how many hops it was from its peers and things like that. So all of these are built into the client and the server technology that we didn't have to redevelop. So we just downloaded, you know, pretty much an open source client and went with it. So what we ended up doing was this exact same two-tier system, but instead we generate that BitTorrent file and we send that BitTorrent file, which is very small, to all the servers. So now all the servers have this BitTorrent file. The clients are already pre-installed on all our machines by default. So like the cust when you deploy a new brand new machine, like our, our Facebook OS image has BitTorrent installed on it. Um, and we, then it connects to our Open Tracker server. And it goes crazy. Uh, it, the, the, the master is seeding the original copy, but the rest of the machines get it really fast. Um, Works really well. So this is what we did in the end. Uh, we took the Open Tracker server and we added affinity towards our own network. Obviously, BitTorrent was designed to work over the internet. Uh, we have more bandwidth than that internally, so we we decided to start um, hacking the torrent server so that it would give you machines or peers closest to you. So it would first give you the machines in your racks, and if it can't find any machine in your rack, then it would go out to the cluster. Uh, since we have, we know exactly where machines are, we can actually do this really well without, you know, without doing any network uh, hop counting. And then the client, we stripped it down as much as we could. We just wanted a very fast, simple client. So we took, we took away a lot of things. We hard-coded some limits in, and uh, we added quicker refreshing for the peers. Um, all in all, you know, three days it was done. And pretty much what, this is what happens in Iraq. There's about 40 machines in Iraq. And the nice thing about Facebook is we have entire racks running web servers or entire racks doing, you know, like search or something. So um, we keep everything close together. So this worked out really well. So the first machine gets four connections from the outside. But now the second machine doesn't need four connections because it already has uh, a machine in there. So it gets uh, one con three connections going out and then goes on. By, by the fourth machine, uh, after the fourth machine, every single connection is in the rack. Uh, and then the next peer refresh, everything is in the rack. And suddenly you have uh, you know, all the machines copying from each other within the rack. And our biggest, our biggest concern was uh, the limitation of our top of the rack switch, which has this, the, the, pretty much we have unlimited capacity within the rack, but once you go out, the uplinks to the cluster uh, are, are smaller. So we solved that problem by doing this. And it worked out pretty well. So the first test I ran, I took 10,000 machines in our data center. Um, I went, actually, I went up to one of the, the capacity planning guys and I said, hey, I want to test BitTorrent on our servers. Um, he didn't like it. Uh, but I said, okay, I just, you know, we, we programmed it to not fail, so hopefully it'll work. So we took 10,000 machines and I created this fake zip file, which is just junk data. And it was 418 me uh, gigabytes, uh, megabytes. And then I sent it to all the machines. I just ran a command. And 58 seconds later, it came back. I honestly didn't believe it. Uh, just 58 seconds, 10,000 machines, this doesn't make sense. Uh, so then I ran a MD5 sum on every single zip file on every single machine. And I collected that. And I made sure they were actually the exact same file. And it was, 58 seconds. So uh, for those counting, it's very, very fast. Um, and we use this. Uh, we use this even today. We use this for everything from um, setting up OS packages. So we'll bring up a very small skeleton OS, and then we torrent all the other RPMs in, and then we install it based from the torrent. So it it took our cluster, like when we turned up entire clusters of machines, it took that down from weeks to days. So it's pretty nice. Um, side effects. Uh, we didn't really notice any crazy load on the CPU. The torrent client works out pretty well. Uh, when you're unzipping and zipping, uh, when you're unzipping the, the the file that landed, then it takes up a little bit of CPU, but multiple cores takes care of that. Um, there was really no effect on the network, especially at the router levels, and there was no dropped packets on the packet level on the rack level, which is what we really cared about. Uh, there was one side effect that we didn't see. This is a, a ganglia graph. It's like a monitoring graph for our, uh, for our cluster. And 
what this shows you is like the in and out traffic. And what happens when I finish my push is this. So like those two are no longer distinguishable. We, don't, we can't tell if you know, they're increasing or decreasing. And, and for about an hour, the graph is screwed up because of the scale. Uh, other than that, you know, it's been working pretty well for us. So you know, um, what, what I really wanted to get out of it is the risks that Facebook lets us take. We have these posters all over campus. Uh, fail harder, move fast and break things. What will you do if you weren't afraid? And honestly, like, I, I couldn't have done this at another company. Uh, after that conference, when I gave my talk, and I met, you know, I, I worked for Yahoo before that. I, I met my VP who, who I used to report to at Yahoo, and he came up to me and he asked me, hey, how long did it really take you to do this? And I told him three days. He's like, no, come on, you know, we're friends. How long did it really take you? And he just couldn't believe that, you know, a company like Facebook would let me do this experimental hack uh, and deploy it to production in three days. It's just, he couldn't comprehend it because in Yahoo, you would have to, like, get permission from this team. You have to go to this team and get permission and things like that. And um, Facebook is just kind of built to... Uh, to to not have these restrictions, we, we're we're uh, we're a very open company, and we kind of like to take risks. And uh, especially if the risk has a huge reward at the end, we will let you do it. So um, that brings me to I wanted to talk a little bit about hackathons. Uh, and since this was done at a hackathon, I thought it would be a perfect opportunity. So hackathons uh, at Facebook are pretty simple. We have two types. Uh, the first one is like an all-night hackathon. It starts at 6 p.m. and ends at 6 a.m. And the, the only rule at hackathon is, if, well, there's two rules. The first one is if it's your first hackathon, you have to take part in the hackathon. You have to hack. And the second, the second rule is you should work on something you don't normally do on your day job. So it's not part of your normal routine. Uh, you want to, you know, if you always wanted to implement a feature at Facebook, that no one ever did, and you had you have an idea, you should try to implement it. You know, I, I talked to someone who wanted a dislike button. Uh, you know, at Hackathon, I think someone did implement a dislike button. It just never made it to product, but uh, it is it is very possible to do something in a night and get it get it out. Um, this is Zuck giving uh, us in inspiration at the Hackathon. He usually takes part in Hackathons as well. He, he's usually walking around asking people what they're working on, and also trying to code uh, himself. Uh, we, you know, the, the main schedule for our hackathons is, you know, you meet up at 6 p.m. and you kind of get together and you say, my ideas are this, I'm looking for people, come help me. Uh, and, uh, you know, other people will rally around you, and then at, in the morning, you hopefully have something to show. And then about a week later, we have something called a prototype form, where all the people who did hackathon projects will come and talk about it. And uh, you know, usually all the execs and Zuck and people like that are sitting in the audience. And this is where our ideas come from. This is actually a picture from when I did the BitTorrent hack. Uh, it's called Camp Hackathon. Camp Hackathons happen every summer. And they're the three day long hackathons. Um, and uh, just a lot of networking. That's me right there. That's Tom. Uh, this is we have food trucks come in in the middle of the night to keep us fueled, uh, and uh, yeah, and it, it's it's a very uh, it's a very, you know it's a very refreshing thing to have. Uh, you know, uh, many of our big uh, products have come out of hackathons, including uh, video messaging, um, chat, and also the latest timeline. Timeline was a hackathon project. It started out as something called Memories. Uh, it, it was pretty much, a, the concept was you would go to a friend's page and you would see your memories together, like you know, events that you've been to, photos that you've been tagged in, and things like that. And then that was done by three engineers and a product designer, and they got together one night, they came up with this concept for uh, memories, and then uh, Mark Zuckerberg saw that, and he actually liked the idea, but he wanted to take it further. He wanted to take it so that if you went to a stranger's profile, you would get something, not just an empty profile, right? So he, you know, tweaked it, and then in the end, 
it came out to be Timeline. So about, it took about a year to get it shipped, mainly because of the infrastructure. Timeline is a very hard product to develop because you pretty much have to keep a billion people's every single activity in memory, and it's not easy. Um, but yeah, so we have these stickers also all the way through campus, and it pretty much says we're 1% done, meaning that we have a lot of new things to develop, a lot of new things to do, and uh, you know, our journey is 1% finished. So that's pretty much all I had. Uh, hopefully you guys have questions for me, um, or you know, anything. We're hiring. Very interesting talk, uh, and uh, I think it's always uh, nice to uh, to know uh, experiences from from other people, and not only uh, in an academic campus, but also in in industry where there are uh, a lot more limitations. Yeah. Uh, but uh, certainly, this is not the way I would have addressed the problem, and this is not the solution I would have developed. Uh, I'm going to tell you my solution. And uh, then I will ask you uh, whether you consider this kind of solution or not, and, and if you discard it, uh, why? Sure. And uh, your opinion, if you didn't consider it, uh, whether you believe uh, it could be a good idea. What I would have done if I had such a large binary to distribute before considering anything about networks and um, also compatible with all the solutions you have tried is simply to split the application into multiple modules and compile them into different dynamic libraries so that uh, you don't need to update everything. You yep. just need to update the library containing the lines of code you updated. So this way, if you split it into, say, 10, uh, 50 libraries, then you just need to update a small fraction of, of the application, not the entire uh, application yep. every time you need to, to perform an update. Obviously, this is compatible with everything you mentioned, with uh, BitTorrent, with multicast, with uh, gzipping uh, the file, whatever uh, solution you would like to, to, uh, to consider. Yep. So, uh, yes, we considered it. Um, it was logistically the way our release process works, um, it didn't work out. Uh, it, it's, I, I mean, I can talk to you offline about it, but uh, it's uh, our, our entire software, like each server, for example, um, handles every single type of Facebook application. Like, so it's just one web server. So it'll handle login, apps, uh, open graph, uh, and Facebook.com. Uh, so our, our consideration was like, how, how about we split up all those domains into different uh, applications? And then maintenance, the, the biggest problem we have um, because of our scale is maintaining uh, like software on each machine. So machines go down a lot. You know, there's bad RAM, there's bad uh, cache, or whatever. And then uh, when they come up, they're running older versions and things like that. And then they need to get the latest software. And having multiple versions of multiple applications, you'd have to really your your configuration system becomes really complicated at that point. Um, so that's one of the reasons we didn't do it. Uh, the second reason was actually part of hip hop. Um, dynamically um, loading libraries was a slower startup time, I think. Uh, so we, we was having one giant binary was faster to boot up because what we actually do is we uh, pipe the entire binary into dev null so that it stays in page cache uh, when we when we load it. So it's really fast to load. So there's a, there's a bunch of things we did. Um, we're still considering it. So what, actually, what we're doing now is moving away from compiled binary again. Uh, we introduced a just-in-time compiler for hip-hop, and we're going back to, into the virtual machine route. So it's always evolving, and probably in about six or nine months, we won't even need the 1.5 gigabyte binary anymore. So again, it's just like a very transient thing. Um, and for us to like complicate our, our environment so much uh, just for you know a few years is going to end up costing a lot more than having a benefit. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, 
It's a very short. So in your uh, company, after a three-day uh, hackathon, how much days do you get uh, off to, to recover from it? So, uh, interesting question. Um, so the three-day hackathon is like you're not, you're not staying up all three days, right? So what usually people do is sleep at the company if they're, if they're staying there late at night. Uh, for the single-day hackathon, it's much, uh, much worse because you're starting at 6 p.m., ending at 6 a.m., and it's on a Wednesday usually. Uh, so your Thursday and Friday, you're pretty much, you know, off. You, you're not feeling right. Um, uh, but it, so we encourage you not to schedule meetings or, you know, like have product deadlines or anything on the next for the rest of the week. Uh, but honestly, like getting people out of their current jobs and doing something else is so much more rewarding than having people do the exact same work every day uh, that it pays off in the end. So yeah, you know, you're not productive the next day or pr probably even the day after, but it's fine. Um, and at Facebook, usually people don't really keep like nine to five schedules. Uh, they're very flexible. So some people I know who come in at 2 p.m. and you know, take a dinner and then leave at 2 a.m. Uh, it really depends. Uh, it depends on your team, depends on yourself, and also depends on your manager. So it's very flexible. So yeah. It, it doesn't bother us. You got are you guys all ready to go? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, you can come come out to me or uh, Janine after. We're going to be outside probably uh, to answer any more questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay, welcome back here. Uh, we are going to explain briefly the solutions of the problems. The PDF of these slides will be available in about two weeks with the problem sets and the solutions. Maybe in, in two weeks, I think. And uh, we are going to explain the problems and each of the problem setters, and then we will uh, give the, the prices and the medals. So let's, let's start. These are the, the names of the problems. Next. The problem setters team was divided in two teams, one international team from lead by Sharia Mansour, and then one, one local team that was also the judges' team. It is uh, Paco, Carlos, Joan, me, then Mario, and Emilio Esther, and then Jonander Gomez. And some statistics about the, the problem solved until during the four hours, the first four hours. So, it seems that the problem B was the easiest one. <laughs> and then apart, we thought that the problem J was the second easier, but nobody tried it until maybe the last hour. And three problems was, were not solved by anybody in the first four hours, but maybe in the last hour someone solved it. We will see in a few minutes. Uh, so next slide. The first one, the first problem behind. If you remove all the history from the problem, you get that you have to calculate the shortest cycle in an undirected graph. 
and there are several algorithms for solving this. And I think the simplest one was start a DFS from each node, just in until you find a, the, an already visit node, and then get the, the shortest one and print at the end. Now the second John will explain. Uh, as Timo had said, uh, this is one of the easiest, maybe it's the easiest, and uh, there are several solutions for, for this. One of them is to try to compute a confusion matrix uh, with the source and target uh, sequences, and then with a few operations, you get the result. Uh, first, it sw swap the zeros and ones that are uh, flip. Then you can check if it's possible to generate enough zeros if you have a, a, enough uh, question marks and, uh, and then with, uh, with a few operations more, you have the, uh, the result. It's to, try to convert the question marks into zeros and, zero and ones, and it's very easy. Uh, this problem is not too difficult, but some pr some teams have had difficulties for solving this problem. Well, this problem can be easily solved uh, if we use the fa prime factorization of the number to determine the sum, which is provided as the input. Let us define some functions, sum of divisors of a given number to be the sum of divisors of x, and the number of divisors to be the number of divisors of x. Of x. Both functions, I'm sorry. <laughs> Both functions can be easily calculated uh, from the prime factorization of n. So we can fix some prime factors to be in, the, in their highest power and calculate the sum of all pairs associated with all numbers having exactly those factors with the power maximized. Let this factor r q sub i and the remaining factors are r sub i. So for this pair, one number have exactly the factors, the number of factors which is the number of diversos of q sub i and to have their power maximized while the other number of the pair is not, maxi is not maximized, it's at least r sub i to have their power maximized. Of course, the set of divisors of n is the union of q and r. We can derive the following expression to calculate this at the summatory of this product where uh, mm, this operation okay, is the R exclusive. Okay? So where n is 2 raised to the no, the cardinality of the set of prime factors, minus 1. Okay, we can easily see this uh, solution with the colors. So we are going to apply this summatory. So if we previously calculate the number of divisors of each number and the sum of divisors and the uh, prime factors rise to the maximum power in the prime factorization, we can do this. So we have to combine number of divisors with the sum of divisors of their R, which is the remaining, and then multiplying by the divisor who has all the factors which are combined in, the, in, in it to the highest who, to the highest power. So we can apply this formula and the final summatory is as easy as that. I think it's not easy, but uh, it's, I think it's difficult if you are not a mathematician and you don't know the formula, but it's one of the issues of this, uh, of this kind of problem. So uh, it's, I am not applying in this formula in order to be easy to understand the modular arithmetic, but of course modular arithmetic must be applied to each multiplication and to its sum. If not, it's not possible to obtain the final result as you already know, I think. So, the next problem. 
Okay, in this case, this problem was uh, one of the proposals was solving this by using dynamic programming using a three dimensional table. You had two dimensions for what was the length of the number of blocks that you have in the string. And the third dimension was for the restriction of the CG pair, okay? Therefore, the first step was uh, erasing what was the string part that could pair themselves, okay, in order to make a shorter, uh, a shorter string to start with the dynamic programming. The dynamic programming is instead uh, it's not really a dynamic, you use a table and use a recursive procedure that consoles this table. And this table, what makes is calculating the pairs in the substring between two given indexes. In this case, you look at the streams, you have an IU. A U pairing, what you make is calculate recursively for the internal substring by adding one more to the start point and subtracting one for the end point. And in case you don't have the A U pair, what you make is all the possible combinations that you have inside, that is uh, uh, cutting the string by each of the possible positions that you have between the start and the end, including the fact that you can skip the first uh, the first base that you have in substring, not matching to, to any other. And what you make is uh, calculate what is the maximum of all these possibilities to, uh, to fill in the corresponding uh, table position with the corresponding, um, the corresponding result, the high result that you have. Well, the next problem is all the school days. Uh, I'm sorry, this problem has not been solved by any team. I'm sorry. Well, the trivial solution of this problem is similar to that. As you see, the behavior is n rise at 4. And if you send this solution in the first minute of the contest, there is no time in five hours to obtain the solution. I'm sorry. So we can try to do the following. Uh, for every point, you can fix one point as the reference point. And then we have to sort all the other points after uh, subtracting the reference point in this order. For example, counterclockwise, okay? And then for each point and in uh, for each other point and the reference point, we use it to do the to well to use it as a diagonal. Okay, so for each possible diagonal, we can do the following: we have a set of triangles in one side of the of this area. Okay, the the space the two the space is divided in two in two sub, in two areas. So, the sum of the triangles in one side must be multiplied by the number of points in the other side. You apply the same, and the, num the sum of the areas of the triangles in the other side multiplied by the number of points in the other side. So, this, is, this, win uh, this uh, 180 degrees window must be moved on. So, you can do the same every time. See, if you do, uh, I come back again, if you do this properly, uh, you can do it in a linear way. So, at the end, you have to use all the points as a reference point. Once you fix one point as a reference point, you have to sort all the other points and log n, and then the calculation may be done in a linear way. So at the end, the solution must be n squared log n. If you don't achieve this solution, the problem can be accepted. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> uh, another question. Uh, this way of solving the problem obtains that a number which is not exactly the number we are looking for because the area of every convex polygon is accumulated four times and the area of each concave polygon is accumulated two times. We have to take this into account in order to correct the final result. And that is all. 
Thank you for your attention in this problem. I'm sorry. I thought that at least so, some teams can solve it, but... Well. The next one was the Sentry Robot. Uh, this problem was solved by, you know, uh, several teams. Uh, if you know the, the Hungarian algorithms, you might know that if we relax the problem and we remove all the obstacles, we can get the minimum number of lines that cover these stars using maximum matching, like a network flow or full friction or whatever. So uh, we can use a network flow and <coughs> just uh, if we have rows in one side and columns in the other side and we connect with a, a edge or with a edge of uh, capacity one if there is a, a point of interest in the in the for example in row zero and column two. Uh, next. But the problem is that we have a obstacle so we need to transform the input into a, a, sim, a compatible grid that has the same topology. Every point of interest is Sees the, every point of interest is the same points of interest, but we can get rid of the obstacles. So this is the, the example transformed into a similar grid that has the same topology, but we don't need the obstacles anymore. And this is one probabilistic solution that one team tried to use, but I'm sorry it didn't work. <laughs> uh, I know this is one of the most famous problems in this contest. Water spiders, or, why, or how the, what, the spiders can work on water. Well, there are several numbers. D is the distance in meters from calm, calm waters to waterfall. P is the spider's jumping power against the current of the water. Okay. If a sequence doesn't match a recurrent relation of second order, then the sequence is complete in the input. That means that in each line, the if the four numbers or several numbers that you find in a line can be uh, can don't excuse me don't match a recurrent relation, then you will find the d plus one numbers. If there are less numbers, it's because it's a recurrent relation of order two. So it can, you only have to obtain a and b with four numbers, only with four numbers. The first four numbers of the of the sequence, you can use them for obtaining this solution. But sometimes uh, there are divisions by zero, so you have be you have concern about that. And maybe some people don't detect this possibility and obtain wrong answer because are doing divisions by zero. I'm sorry, but this problem for. My point of view is the easiest problem. I don't, well, I, but I, it's preferable that I don't say anything. I remember when I was a child, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, little spiders on water when I, uh, near uh, close the house of my, uh, my grandmother and I, was uh, as, uh, uh, hallucinating because I, I wonder how the spider neck, 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 and I remember this idea, and it's a good problem for the swerk. Okay? But is the, we can uh, answer questions because we have no time. Several people need to go to the airport, I'm sorry. We have to end this presentation and then begin the the... The award ceremony, I'm sorry. Uh, Chef. Okay. Um, this problem uh, could be solved 
by considering a discrete knapsack program. The Grady solution is not optimal, and the complete solution doing back backtracking is not in time, it's not working in time. So several considerations to solve this problem. Uh, first of all, we should calculate all the profits obtained by each packet, and those packets that have a negative profit or a cost greater than the available cap capital C should be delete deleted. Um, okay, the, uh, the cost or it should be solved by dynamic programming, and the, we, these are the these are the costs. And the tricky point is using the greatest command divisor to reduce the memory cost to in order to solve that problem in time. Well, me again. <laughs> so, uh, this problem is also very easy. This problem is solved by the AS star algorithm. You have to, fo to find the, the heuristic. The heuristic is as easy to determine which is G and which is H. G is the greater satisfaction of the current hypothesis, which can include the satisfaction or not of the current node. Okay? Because when you, in the, in the A star, it's time that you have to, to come, excuse me, to, to expand on a hypothesis, you need to expand the hypothesis, uh, uh, to a couple of hypotheses. One considering that you enter the bar and get the satisfaction of, of this bar or path or not. Okay? And the heuristic is the function that you use to order the hypothesis in the priority queue. So each is the time required to reach the goal from the current node using the flow workshop that you can pre-compute or pre-calculate when you load each map of the, the input. And that's, that's all. Well, finally, the countdown problem that uh, it was a problem that, in our opinion, was uh, quite easy to, to solve. Uh, surprisingly, not many people uh, work it out uh, during the competition. And it was, uh, could be uh, solved by using uh, an exhaustive search, a breadth or a dead first search. Okay? In this case, you have a available set of numbers for each case, and uh, you check all the possibles for addition, subtraction, with a negative result, of course, multiplication and integral division, exact division, with all the possible uh, all the possible numbers that you have. Okay, therefore the process could be, for example, uh, implemented by creating a queue in which uh, in each node you have the available numbers, that is the original numbers and the possible results of the operations raising the numbers that you use. The last operation you perform in order to retrieve the history when you arrive to the final result and, of course, a point to the previous node, okay? Therefore, when you are making the, the exploring, uh, when you find the solution, you can stop the process and you can go back in the queue and retrieve what is the sequence of operations and print it then properly in the, in the output. In case you don't have a non Excel result, you have to perform a steep, uh, exhaustive steep search. That is, you have to look for all the possible combinations that you can have with these numbers and these operators. And finally, you have to find what is the closest solution that you have. Of course, this problem, you don't have a, a unique sequence of, oper of operations to, uh, to, per to obtain a correct result. But uh, in our solution, that is, when we were checking the possible sequence of operations that you sent, we contemplated all the possible options that arrive to a corresponding result, to a, a, a result. And, well, this is all. Yeah, it's over. Well, that's all. We are going to begin the award ceremony. Thank you very much, judge, team.
Well, welcome back. Now we are going to begin the award ceremony. Silence, please. Uh, here we have with me Jorge Diaz from Coritel. Thank you for attending the award ceremony. Janine Bell from Facebook. Thank you for attending the award ceremony. Miguel Rodilla, the system administrator of the Uba Online Judge. Thank you also. And Maria Jose Castro, which is the vice dean of this school. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to show you the ranking from place 44 up to 13. Okay. These are the classification. There are several teams in the same last position. Yuba, Sigmentation 4, Insa 1, at Simpson, Code Breakers. In 39, Caparica, Sympathetic Frontier. In 38, Orignal. 37, Darcera. 36, Debuggers. 35, Le Visiteur. 34, at Sim 1. 33, Caribou. 32, Freedom Alex. 31, UPF, 30, Ancelistas, 314, and 29, Turing, 28, Insa 2, 27, Insa Leon, 26, Fizz, 25, Concurrence, 24, Distra is coming, 23, at Sim 3, 22, Polir Sera, please, silence, is not a team. Uh, 22 Polir Sera, 21 Evil Poker Faces from Lausanne, 20 Crocker Salati, 19 Nultin, 18 Los Muchos Buenos, 17 UPC 3, 16 88 Underdogs, 15 Hombres C, 14 Lauthurius, and 13 ends own three. Now we are going to begin the hour ceremony in order to uh, give the medals to the teams who has medals. So, medals and the dip diplomas or the honor mention or okay, the awards. Well, in the 12th position, Royal House Scripts Analyst. In the 11th place, Os Lutadores do Fo.
Now, 10th place, 3D. In the ninth place, escape. Now, silver medalist in the A place, enter from a corporate enemy. Well, in the seventh place, Polly Nikes. In the sixth place, hands on two.
Well, in the fifth place. Hey, what? Oh, I'm sorry. The computer is too sensible. UTC. Now it's time for gold medalists. Uh, we have to follow, and maybe the the mystery is going to be revealed. Elms own one third place gold medalist. Now I need to, to eat something. Can you wait a little, please? <laughs> no? Well, after looking at, uh, after showing the third, maybe the first prize will be revealed. In the third prize, in the third place, gold medalist, <laughs> chocolate. Well, in the second place, and maybe in the last minute, UPC2.
Now the secret has been revealed. The winner is UPC1. First place. Well, finally, we have to, to resume this presentation. In this edition, 44 times, excuse me, 44 teams from two, for 27 different universities. So I am now. Congratulations to the winner who will attend. MCM CPC World Final 2013 in St. Petersburg. Well, congratulations again for the winner. <laughs> now, now before closing this session, this award ceremony, I will remember you. I would like to remember you that. All this has been possible thanks to my university, my school, my department, because a lot of money is needed and also all the infrastructure of this university and the department and of the school. Also, this kind of uh, events or competitions is possible thanks to our, sp our sponsors here in the table, we have a representant from Coretel and another person, Janine Bowler from Facebook. Thank you very much for your support. <laughs> and I also I would like to give thanks to all my team, my human team, who have who has helped me during a lot of the years working. Problem setters and judges who have spent a lot of time preparing this, solving the problems several times in several languages, etc. The system administrator who prepared all the computers, the servers, in a very efficient way that it has run perfectly. Also the volunteer students who has help us a lot with his effort and finally my college of this university all of this thank you for all Well, thank you for your attention. It's where 2012 ends. And see you next year in Valencia.